This week at Starbase, while construction continues for Pad 2, the air separation plant, and Gigabay, Booster 15 is static fired ahead of its second mission, and crews waste no time reconfiguring the Pad 1 launch mount for Ship 38 static fire. Does this mean Booster 15 static fire was a success, or were there any other issues encountered during the test? Well, let's dig into this week's update and find out. Starting off this week with the fabrication updates, on Friday afternoon, the forward section of the B-18.3 test tank emerged from the Star Factory and was staged inside the ring yard. About an hour later, the next part of the test article, this one, a common dome section, was also rolled out of the Star Factory and staged next to the first piece. The next day, first the common dome section and later the forward section with its new permanent hot staging section were taken into Mega Bay 1 for stacking. Also on Saturday, Vacuum Raptor number 581 was moved to Mega Bay 2 and eventually taken to the left side of the building, likely for installation on Ship 38. Early on Thursday, Rover Camera caught welders working on what appeared to be a new header tank inside the nose cone aisle of Star Factory. Moving on to construction at the launch complex, early on Friday, the continuous flight auger that was working on piles for the new air separation plant across from the launch complex was moved up the road to Starhopper's parking lot, likely to be prepared for departure. Over by the D2 gate, work continues on the new mega bunker with the roadside building steel skeleton taking shape. A large piping manifold was lifted into place to connect the recently delivered water tanks to the rest of the deluge farm. Moving up the road to the build site, in the early hours of Saturday morning, a fresh concrete pour got underway for the next section of the foundation for the new Gigabay. The pour continued through the morning and in the end lasted over 10 hours and used almost 150 trucks of concrete. Moving on to the week's testing activities, early Friday morning a booster transport stand was brought from the Sanchez site to the ring yard. A few hours later, the stand was moved into Mega Bay 1. That afternoon at the pad, the booster quick disconnect was tested on Mount 1 as SpaceX worked to prepare for the upcoming static fire. Overnight, Booster 15 was rolled out of Mega Bay 1 and onto Highway 4 for its journey to the launch site. Following the short trek up the road, the flight-proven rocket was taken over to Pad 1 and parked between the waiting arms of Mechazilla. Before the Saturday sun began to lighten the Texas skies, Booster 15 was lifted off its transport stand and carefully transferred to the launch mount in preparation for its pre-launch static fire testing. Later that morning, once the booster was properly secured in place, crews got to work disassembling the scaffolding from the top deck of the launch mount. Around that same time, the rocket's transport stand was moved out of the launch complex and parked across the road near Hoppy to wait out the testing. That evening, the launch mount work platform was lowered onto its stand and then moved to join the transport stand across the road. A little while later, an apparent partial test of the detonation suppression system was observed with some lower pressure discharge from the underside of the mount. About an hour later, the chopsticks were open and raised up the tower in preparation for the upcoming testing. Next up, we saw a more substantial test of the detonation suppression system, although it was once again followed by some lower pressure discharging from the outlets once again. After dawn on Sunday morning, the tank farm was spooled up and Venti could be seen from the launch mount as SpaceX began pre-chilling stage zero ahead of the day's testing. And less than an hour later, SpaceX began loading propellant into booster 15. Then, just before 10.20 local time on Sunday morning, Booster 15's 33 Raptor engines roared to life as the rocket became the second Super Heavy to perform a pre-launch static fire after already completing a successful launch and recovery. Following the successful test, SpaceX got to work detanking the booster. A few hours later, the work platform and the booster transport stand began rolling back across the road and over to Pad 1. Once the final tests were completed, the work platform was raised back to the underside of the mount. In the early hours of Monday morning, less than 17 hours after the static fire, Booster 15 was lifted back off the launch mount and transferred onto its awaiting transport stand. Once the rocket was secure, the chopsticks were moved down from the lift points, opened and lowered to the stops while the ship quick disconnect arm swung back in. About an hour later, Booster 15 was rolled across the pad and onto Highway 4 to begin its journey back to the build site. Upon arriving, the Super Heavy was parked in front of Mega Bay 1. 
Eventually, the building's door was open, and later that evening, the booster's grid fins were rotated and it was taken into the building. In the early hours of Tuesday morning, the rocket was lifted off its transport stand and transferred to the work stand in the back left corner of Mega Bay 1 for final launch preparations. The empty stand was rolled out and returned to the Sanchez site for storage. Back at the launch complex, crews got to work on the launch mount, working inside the booster quick disconnect and reinstalling scaffolding as they began to prepare the mount for a ship static fire. The ship quick disconnect adapter was then spotted rolling down Highway 4 to the launch complex. Monday night, it was lifted and affixed to the launch mount in preparation for the upcoming static fire of Ship 38. On Tuesday, all the booster hold-down clamps were removed from the launch mount and the engine chill collection manifold lifted for installation. Around midnight Wednesday morning, the ship's static fire launch mount adapter was brought back to the launch complex. SpaceX's crane then began moving across the launch site to Pad 1. Later that morning, the crane lifted the adapter onto the launch mount and crews got to work installing it where the booster hold-down clamps had previously been removed. Early Thursday, with its work at Pad 1 complete, SpaceX's crane was moved back across the complex to Pad 2. On Tuesday, the booster thrust simulator was relocated from the Massey outpost to the ring yard. Later that day, crews were observed working on the eyelets on the test stand's hydraulic rams. On Thursday, the stand was taken into Mega Bay 1, likely for the B18.3 test tank to be used in Block 3's booster structural qualification testing. On Wednesday, a slew of water trucks were observed making trips to the launch complex as SpaceX worked to replenish the system ahead of another static fire campaign. Switching over to a somewhat slower week for Falcon 9 operations in Florida, on Friday morning, Booster 1069 lifted off from Space Launch Complex 39A, carrying another 28 Starlink satellites to orbit for the Starlink Group 10-57 mission. Following the launch and landing, the rocket and fairing halves were returned to Port Canaveral for processing. Late on Thursday, Booster 1078 blasted off from Space Launch Complex 40 for the new Santerra Lima mission, delivering the Indonesian telecommunications satellite to geostationary orbit. In other space news, SpaceX announced this week that they have entered into an agreement with EchoStar with the intent of enabling a step change in performance for the Starlink Direct to Cell constellation. As part of the agreement, EchoStar will receive cash, SpaceX stock, and payments from SpaceX towards EchoStar's debt, as well as access to the direct-to-sell network for their Boost Mobile customers. In return, SpaceX will get 50 MHz of exclusive S-band spectrum in the United States, as well as global mobile satellite service licenses from EchoStar. Relativity Space shared another monthly update on their Terran R rocket, including their completion of another 18 component level critical design reviews, most of which were related to the rocket's second stage engine. They've also finished welding all the barrel sections for the inaugural flight rocket, assembled the first flight engine, and kicked off testing of the development article for the second stage engine called Aeon V. NASA's Office Inspector General released its report on the management of the Dragonfly mission this week. It found, among other things, that the significant cost increases and scheduling delays were caused in large part by management decisions. The report also laid out recommendations for how to proceed from here. Stoke Space posted on X that they have completed structural qualifications for their Nova rocket. This included a battery of tests that proved that the article exceeded design margins. On Wednesday, NASA shared photos of a Martian rock analyzed last year by their Perseverance rover. While not conclusive, NASA theorizes that the spots in the rock are most likely the biosignature of microbial life that existed on the Red Planet billions of years ago. On Thursday, at Historic Launch Complex 39A, a newly assembled crane could be seen lifting the first leg for the pad's new Starship launch mount as development of the infrastructure pushes forward. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already, guys, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Lab Padre out.